A world where even the glorious potential that life on other planets can be used to create opportunity for warmongering. What a world we live in. What a corrupt and despicable world. Football's not like that. Football is nice. Hello and welcome to Football is Nice with Russell Brand and Gareth Roy. We've got Mark Goldbridge on the show a little bit later, host of the Manchester United YouTube channel, The United Stand. We're going to be looking at him becoming increasingly enraged as Manchester United fail to materialise, nearly materialise, dematerialise. They're an ontological entity that are even beyond physics at times. This is Premier League Eve. We stand on the precipice of a new season. New dramas will unfold, new heroes. Heroes will be minted, new villains forged. Will it be VAR that defines this season? Or will it be the 100 minute game? Is that the scandal that we have yet to taste on, in my case, my sweet velvet lips? And in the case of Gareth Roy, it's a rather. Actually, they're quite nice lips as well. Never really looked at Thank them before. You. Thanks for joining us, Gareth, for uh, this part of your job. Thank you so much, it's Russell. nice for you to be here. Yep. Uh, what do you think about 100-minute games? Yeah, is this a new talking point. Will they have sorted out the handball rule will be the other one, right? You know, they always talk about the handball rule now. It's a bit like the Donald Trump case. <laughs> Did you know that yeah. you were going to touch that ball with your hand? Is that a natural position mm. for your mind to be in? Mm. So is that what it is? Is Has it changed? I don't know. But, you know, there's a lot of talk of it last season and pundits kind of saying they'll sort it out they'll next sort season. They'll sort it out next season. Out. They'll, like, have, they'll have to. They'll have to. Like, they do have to be, you meant to do that <laughs> yeah. with your hand. It can't be that it brushes. What I know for sure is however they manoeuvre that rule, mm. it will penalise West Ham in some of way. Course, of course like, it with, will. like with offside and like, <laughs> you know, like, what I remember from last season is the early part, we were about to equalise through your man, Jared Bowen, against Chelsea. He scored a goal that just should have been allowed yep. and it was disallowed for really weird reasons. Like, it don't even make sense to me anymore. Like, it clattered that. into... You know, that lad that Chelsea... Have, how many goalkeepers have Chelsea sold and bought this season? How many players have they sold, uh, bought and sold? I mean, it's ridiculous. Is it? It's been a real merry-go-round. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't know... It's unrecognisable. I don't know how I would feel as a Chelsea fan. Exactly that. The team is unrecognisable. I mean, when you change... I mean, it feels like almost the entire team has changed. It's not the same It's not the same manager. It's not the same board. Yeah. Stadium's changed. What is it you're shouting at? What exactly is it you support in there? It's like it's, it's becoming increasingly right. it's becoming increasingly abstract. But I suppose this is a we, we'll be able to make a broad appraisal of the season here. We're about to talk about who we reckon is going to win. Is mm. anyone going to say anyone other than City? Uh, we're going to talk about top four. We can talk about relegation and talk about who might come up. We can sort of take broad stabs at things, mm. can't we? Are you excited really? about it? I'm excited. No, because we still ain't bought anyone at all. Right. The people that we are likely to buy are people I don't want. I want that lad Alvarez out yeah. of Ajax. I, I I don't know much in... about him, except he's good. You like his name, don't you? Alvarez. And you like Love... the Ajax thing. Ajax. <laughs> Alvarez of Ajax. Yes. That's double A. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, if that was a good. battery, you'd buy it. But like, uh, I'm, I'm worried about McTominay mm. and I'm worried about Maguire. Right. I'm worried about the MU Mooks. I don't, that's I'm just worried, I'm worried about, about the kind of two for one aspect with that deal. It, it seems I two think... for one doesn't usually represent anything <laughs> other than a bargain that's based on quantity <laughs> over quality. You know, one. Yeah. What about two? I suppose that is more. Here are these two <laughs> underperforming, <laughs> uninspiring, somewhat expensive. Now, McTominay is McTominay, intermittently good. I would say so. And for Scotland, incredible. Absolutely incredible. He's been amazing for Scotland. And uh, for United, you could argue he hasn't had the chances, especially last year. Um, but I, I do think that he's a, he's a good player. And obviously, as a whole supporter, I like Maguire of a few years ago. But... I don't know what will have happened. And even to him. Leicester Maguire, yeah. and even Easter Island head Maguire. <laughs> all of those versions of Maguire we all like. And Maguire, I don't look. Do you know what? I always think of them as human beings because that is, of course, what they are. Mm. And I try not to be like a right little bastard and mm. sort of criticise people. But I was hoping for Harvey Barnes, Newcastle. I was hoping for James yeah. Ward Prowse. I don't think that's going to happen. Well, they're saying it's too much money. Well, you can get both. You can get both of these players for the same money. You can get what Maguire and McTominay <laughs> for the so. price. I would like, but can we just have James Ward and the Prowse we're getting a few years if it works out? You know, like I'd rather break them down their mm. double-barrel names than mm. like I don't know about that. As also as well, 
Like as a West Ham player, it feels I would prefer the uh, excuse me, the <laughs> I know. fan. Oh, wow. I, I, pr I prefer oh, Jesus Christ the ego. <laughs> uh, I prefer the feeling of um, sucking people up out of the championship. I bet you do. <laughs> I oh, suck them up, I hoover them up, my sinuses, rather than the feeling of yeah. people tumbling downwards. Down. Yeah, we've, I don't think we've had many good signings like that. Sure. I'm trying to think of any actually. No, and the one player who it looked like would make that move was Lingard when he had that fantastic season he should have done for himself he really should have done now he's left Forest, I think even that what's yeah. next Galatasaray <laughs> tends Surely. to be the next move Surely. after that yeah. it's like some... now a Turkish giant Svenabarche <laughs> oh it's good when they have that when they have that derby it's ever such a seething atmosphere <laughs> well if you want to see the atmosphere go anywhere in England because you've betrayed us all <laughs> yeah like uh, so yeah that, that didn't work out I'm just trying to think of when we get like you know we have had from Jimmy Greaves to Ian Wright to Liam Brady like we've had post Sir Clive Allen like we've had post uh, peak stars yeah. throughout our history but it's always better when it's like when I think of the great players like Payet, a find, yes. you know, the Cano, yes. and even more latterly the likes of Jared yeah. or Antonio like, I guess it's like what does it suggest your club is as in is it finding, mm. as you say, players from around the globe that kind of, you know, which suggests that you have a great scouting network? Uh, or is it plucky, uh, yeah. great players from Jack the championship? Jack Wilshire, Lundberg. Whenever we take them lot off Arsenal yeah. in decline, it's not, it's a, not it a good use of money. It doesn't paint you in a great light as a club, I don't I think. I don't think so. But this is what I worry about is the pathology of Moyes. I feel like David Moyes, because of his own wounding at United, yeah. might sort of think, I can like take other poor wounded souls mm. from Man U. Mm. And th these are all things we can talk to Mark Goldbridge about because he's an expert in all of these uh, players. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, mate, what do you want to talk about in your podcast <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we've got a new uh new title sequence from bad graphics jack as well as a host of topics to talk about and i think uh, uh shall we have a look at bad graphics jack is this for is this for our predictions are we going straight predict to predictions this here says that trump this is interesting it says that trump's legal team consists of a selection of wayne rooney's <laughs> that's pretty amazing that's oh god that is wow. good Donald it's Trump, Rooney. this in American football news, Donald Trump is supported by entirely by Wayne Rooney's <laughs> at different embryonic phases. Yes. There's late Rooney to Trump's left. Mm. There's classic current Rooney immediately to the right of Trump. And then there's the thinking man's Rooney just at the edge of frame there. And also Munch's scream just above <laughs> Trump, Trump's shoulder there as a sort of a, a, a nice addition. That's a bold courtroom artist right there. It really is. That's absolutely, absolutely captured you, that, isn't it, mate? Yeah, well, Rooney is interesting, isn't it? Because he's doing, he's managing apparently very well Who at now? the moment with his big beard. He's in Who's the, he managing? Is he the MLS or China, Toronto or America? one of those? I think it's in America or Canada that he's at and apparently doing very well. Aren't people worried that Saudi Arabia's transfer window stays open too long yes and premier league players are going to get hoovered out yeah. in the hundredth minute the 115th minute of play you'll suddenly see mo salah galloping off to and uh, yeah. saudi because they're seemingly unable our dc united it is with Rooney. um yeah they're seemingly unable to do anything about it i mean liverpool was reading that uh Klopp wanted to keep henderson but just the the lure of that money was just oh, too much you know people were ever so upset about henderson they were they? the There's... thing is with glorious money is that you can sort of persuade yourself almost anything mm. with, like like sort of jordan henderson would have gone from being an avid supporter of lgbtq plus issues mm. in the world cup to thinking that is so much money <laughs> yeah. i'm not ever gonna have to do anything again and no. like we sort of say oh come on mate you're getting a lot of money anyway mm. but it's all relative. So much money yeah. that you're going to get there. Probably you get favourable tax Taxing. arrangements wow. out there in Saudi as well. I mean, who you're among us about can it, say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can see right where this is leading. Thinking, is there a lower league team <laughs> in Saudi Arabia that would take me as a sort of a player manager? Yeah. 
Or is there some kind of uh, streaming platform? They've not yet offered us anything. People sort of ask sometimes, would you do like stand up in sort of nations right. like that? And the answer is we would. <laughs> Can you just please just send the offers and we'll find a way of morally justifying it to ourselves <laughs> retrospectively. Need a producer? David, we, we, well, I will, yeah. <laughs> David, David Foster Wallace, he goes, um, like when talking about John McCann's incarceration subsequent to his capture in Vietnam, that of course his plane crashed in a swamp. He was captured by Viet Cong, had his arms broken, was stabbed with a bayonet in the groin. And then when he was taken to the prisoner of war camp, he was offered early release because they found out that he was a high up. And indeed, mm. his relatives in the McCann family were like part of the Admiralty. McCain? Is it McCain? Uh, yes, McCain. Sure, I'm yeah. talking about oven chips I thought so you're yeah. right very no, similar these are these are very reasonable <laughs> chips and for us 20 minutes in the oven sorry that whole beginning of that was meant to be about oven chips sure. <laughs> and also die hard um, no John McCain mm. who I, is who I mean anyway like when it came to the release they wanted to release him as part of a bargaining deal because they thought they'd get more, loads of prisoners for him but the Geneva Convention plus I don't know protocols of the US military uh, dictate that prisoners should be released in the order that they were captured and McCain refused to be released out of sequence they like we want to release you now mate and he said no I'm oh. staying you've got to release all this lot first so John McCain whether you agreed with his politics or not right. had morals and he didn't and why I'm mentioning this now is because David Foster Wallace in an essay about this said imagine yourself in that situation mm. the excuses you would use <laughs> to yeah. accept that deal you go I may be taking this deal yeah. but I will dedicate my life to releasing other prisoners <laughs> and in fact in the long run this will work out better for them because I will use my time and influence <laughs> so then he goes imagine the things you'd remember the smell of your wife's hair all these things he mm. goes so whatever you think about John McCain he's a person who in that situation did that so that's why ethics and morality... Although, to be fair, Stephen Gerrard would never want to sign John McCain. He, not, uh, like, uh, certainly not in goal, because he couldn't <laughs> lift his arms above his head <laughs> due to the torture that he received <laughs> during that period. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but well, I suppose like when you see people wear rainbow laces or a badge or an armband or take the knee or whatever, the charge that exists in our culture now is that these gestures of virtue signalling, as it's commonly known, are... Uh, actions undertaken without cost or consequence yeah. that, like when it if it like the real sacrifice and real activism if you think of like i don't know gandhi and it seems perhaps a little unfair to compare jordan anderson to mahatma gandhi perhaps the greatest civil rights leader in history like and a hell of a right back I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't track back Gandhi and he had no gas for the overlap. Gandhi track back. I will not track back. <laughs> um, like uh, that, I suppose that's what it does to you, isn't it? It's like that when it comes to it. Oh, yeah. oh, like if we were to talk to Jordan Henderson, it'd go oh, bloody hell. I think it's unfair. I have to say. You just say yeah. let people. Do I, it. I think all of this stuff that gets labelled at footballers. I mean, again, a bit of a trope and a cliche now to say this, but it is one of those you know few areas where working class people can earn a lot of money, and it's one of the. It's so one of the few the, areas where working class people can prop up a corrupt regime. <laughs> <laughs> Just right. let them. But, you know, there are there are so many awful things going on in I know. the world. You've got cherry picking. I mean, I actually agreed in the end with, um, like, say, Simon Jordan's analysis of the Qatar World Cup. Like, hang on. I mean, absolutely. They're, what, what are they doing really that's any worse than stuff we either do or have done? You right. can't. If you're going to make these arguments with any sincerity, Let's get ready to dismantle the machinery of capitalism and start building ecologically friendly, anarcho-syndicalist, decentralised tribes. Yeah. And given that no one's doing that, you might as well not criticise Jordan yeah. Anderson and for Jordan doing Jordan Anderson is definitely not getting paid more than America are making selling uh, arms to Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, so, uh, right, <laughs> so what's the real issue here? Yeah. And yeah, Or the way that Raytheon and Lockheed Martin are profiting from the ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia, which is still posed as a moral crusade in a kind of cake and eat it yeah. capitalist uh, sort of orgy of uh, profit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, hold on. I had one more thing to say about this that was pretty good and I think was going to be the real, sort of really seal the deal was in either it? direction. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I was going to seal it once and for all, but I don't know. Should we go to Mark Goldbridge yet? Oh, all right, let's have a look at these prediction title sequence. I've got my, still got one more point. Bad Graphics Jack has been doing the thing. Have a look at it. Hmm. Hmm. He 
always does that. It does. He always does end. things like where there's a sort of real sting in the tail, doesn't he, yeah, bad yeah. graphics, Jack? It does, yeah. He also has the sort of energy of Saturday morning TV <laughs> from <laughs> 1997, yeah. doesn't it? Everything's like something that would introduce Trevor and Simon <laughs> on Live and Kicking. <laughs> That's a reference. So, yeah, look it up. Um, uh, yeah, uh, well, what predictions are we going to make? Should we make a prediction? Okay. I'll make a prediction. I mean, who's sure. going to? there's no point predicting anything except for total domination of Manchester City, is there? No. I would suggest not. Because no. they bought two players, they improve them, haven't they? I yeah. mean, they let go of a couple of people that they, they wanted to let go yeah, of. Gundogan's gone, hasn't he? So and he obviously got them a lot. Of, he was amazing for them. Scored a very nice goal in uh, the cup final. I wonder cup if final, Mark yeah. Goldbridge saw that. I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> if he did. Um, yeah, like and Mares, that don't matter. Well, you know, they've and always got... They just bought back some. They bought some centre back who looks tasty. Yeah, from Leipzig. Yeah, apparently. Pep and says what Kovacic? Uh, Kovacic. Kovacic, Kovacic from Chelsea, yeah. Another smart signing at 25 million, I think they got him for. How are you going to say Guardiol? Is I that think out? just did. Do you think that they got him because his name's a bit like Guardiola? I think they did, yeah. Do you know I like Guardiola? What about Guardiol? Close enough. Get him in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, City, surely, again. I, and obviously, they could still buy a few more players. I think Carl Walker's agreed to stay, I read today, which is, like, good for them. He was very good last season, Carl Walker. Why don't Man United buy someone like bloody Harry Kane? <laughs> like, it's no good him going to Bayern Munich. That's boring. Well, that's because they refuse to sell him to Man United, which is, I, right. un I understand Levy's like, no. We're that's not they're one of their main people they like to sell people to. Yeah, I they know. They like to sell them Teddy, Sheringham and Berbatov. This is exactly like that. But I think they're in positions where they had to before, whereas in they the Kane situation, they, they... Sell him to Germany. Yeah, although apparently that's not even happened. They're really, he's really digging his heels in. Well, he's a master negotiator, as we know. One thing we all know about <laughs> Daniel Levy, for some reason, is that he is a master negotiator. Distinct from all other from chair all. people. Yep. Weird, isn't it? It really is, yeah. What is he doing in there? <laughs> is he just like, it can only be people go, listen, we'll give you 100 million for Harry Kane, even though he's only got a year left in his contract. And he goes, no. Yeah. That's it. It's I mean, it. that's not master. That, that's <laughs> just he's obstreperous and uh, oppositional. Sure. Yeah. Anyone can just say no to things, right. except Zamo. I'm really trapped in the 80s. Really I? I'm really, I can't, <laughs> really can't get are. out of the 1980s. <laughs> Yeah. What's wrong with me? I don't know, mate. What I don't is know. it? It's fine, though. So, yeah, so are, are we doing worrying. predictions of winners? All right, I Man mean, City we're, win. Obviously, we're is saying it, Man City. Like, who's going to come second? Are you going to say Chelsea? Are you going to say Arsenal? Uh, Arsenal Liverpool? won the Shield the other day. I mean, I know that's never an indication. I think, like, one team who won the Shield has won the Premier League in the last 10 years or something. So that's not an indication that Arsenal will be winners this season. The community Shield. I know. <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it? So the silly. Community Shield. Yeah. What community? Mm. They give a bit of money to charity yes, out of the back of it, do they? Happens. They're loving it, though. Look, aren't they? They're really yeah. they're pleased to have that Shield. Well, it's become like a big thing. It didn't used to be all that big, did it? The Community Shield. Where's Declan Rice? Oh. Did he not go? Oh, Trouble in Paradise. He went. Did he play? Yeah, he did play. Played the old game. What numbers he wear? Eight. I don't, I don't get all. No, it's sad just over. Some funny number. No, I can just see. Some number that I think would suit oh, him. Oh, he's not over it, is he? I am over it. He's I'm not. glad he's gone. <laughs> I wanted him to go. <laughs> I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I'm pleased that we sold him, and I'm even more pleased that we've not signed anyone to replace him. Those seem like good decisions. You're getting Harry Maguire. Stop complaining. <laughs> I don't want Harry Maguire. You can have a Scott McTominay for that. I don't want Scott McTominay neither. I did see a tweet that said that West Ham were going to either buy the pair for 40 million or McTominay on his own for 42. <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke like that, yeah. don't you? Mm. It's a right out of order. It's so out of order. So out of mm. order. Poor Harry Maguire. Mm. Uh, yeah. Predictions? Let's get Mark Goldbridge yes. on. He's yeah. got his own YouTube channel. He's doing really well. Mm. People love him. Let's have a look at a few examples of Mark Goldbridge taking it real bad that he's a Man United fan and Man United fan won't do what it's supposed to do and what it used to do, win football games easily. One, two, three, everybody go, go City! Let's do it for our history. Look, Man City have gone long ball already there. Flicked into Haaland. Oh my God. 15 seconds in! No oh, fucking hell. I'm gone, I'm finished. No, no, no! Seven fucking nil!
One nil. It's fucking one nil. That's horrible. It's like walking on your parents having sex. That midfield has got the positional sense of a blindfolded slug trying to find a Mars bar at a Weight Watchers convention. And it's 2-2. Back in. Game on. Let's go again. They're on the attack here. You can sod off meowing as well, you bloody Arsenal fan. Mark, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. What's it been like to transition from that period of success into, let's call it, a rather more turbulent period as a United fan? Is that a very painful thing? Have there been brief moments of respite and joy within it, or has it been a real grind? Um, I think I, I heard, um, I read somebody say a few years ago that, um, you know, you've got to appreciate the fact that we had so much success that it goes in swings and roundabouts. And now it's a period of bad times that you've just got to put up with. But that's like being rich for 20 years and then living in a tent in a, in a forest, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to go, this is acceptable. Um, the serious answer is, you know, the club has been run badly and never should have fell as far as it has from the tree. But I'll be honest, there has... It is quite humbling because obviously under Sir Alex, it was um, every year you expected to win things. Whereas now you can sort of appreciate the fact that the, the, the reality of football is that there's a lot of fans out there that don't have success as well. So, yeah, it's funny. It's quite funny watching those clips back because it is just utter despair that most fans probably have for 99 percent of their lives. Yeah, it's uh, striking as well because I think the quality that it has just watching it uh, analytically is people enjoy watching authentic content and you can see that you allow yourself to have natural reactions to the frustration and disappointment that being a Man United fan has latterly included. Now, let's talk a little bit, mate, about Maguire and McTominay. How are Man United going to cope with the loss of such significant skeletal figures that are holding together the framework of that club? Uh, how, how do you actually feel about the departure of them players? And also, do you think that uh, Ten Hag's going in the right direction? And what kind kind of appointments are required to get United anywhere near where they need to be to challenge City? Is Hoyland going to be enough? Just give us an overview from, from those potential West Ham departures all the way up to Hoyland, if you can, mate. Yeah, well, look, I know you're a West Ham fan, Russell, so I'm very careful of who might be watching in the higher up corridors of West Ham of what I, was, of what I truthfully say about Harry Maguire and Scott McTominay, because I think they would be very good signings for West Ham, and I think there's good value in going up to maybe 70 million for the pair. But um, no, look, you know, Scott McTominay's an interesting one. Um, I've never been a massive fan of his in the sense that I don't think he's a first team player for Manchester United, but I think playing regularly, I do think he would he, he would he would be a suitable player for a for a West Ham or an Everton type thing. Um, I know the type thing. What does that mean? Yeah, it'd be good. He'd be a good midfielder for a West Ham. But no, I think. But Harry Maguire is probably the more interesting one. I mean, look, I, I, I'm fully aware that West Ham fans don't want these players. I'm trying to talk them up a little bit. But Harry Maguire is an England centre back. He's not a Manchester United centre back, but he's an England centre back and. I, I think what I was listening to what you said before. I think David Moyes and his ex Manchester United, um, you know, journey might be what he's looking at here. Uh, I've done well at West Ham, and maybe these players can do well at West Ham. Um, look, I think I think they would do well. I, I can't believe we rejected thirty million pounds for Scott McTominay. I don't know. I heard you saying earlier about how he plays well for Scotland, but it, it amazes me that United would reject thirty million pounds for him because I just don't know where that value has come from. Um, Rasmus Hoyland, I really like. Um, that's the sort of thing that Manchester United should be doing. Uh, we did this a few years ago. Obviously, Cristiano Ronaldo would be the most obvious choice where you go and buy a teenager from Sporting Lisbon and they become a great player. Manchester United, over the last decade, talking about failure, have sort of fallen into this trap of spending a lot of money on other people's players, whether it be Di Maria or Pogba or... Um, trying to think, yeah, Anthony, etc. Whereas I think with, with Hoyland... I, I like the idea of, but it's a bit like the Brighton way. Everyone loves the Brighton way. You buy a player that's well scouted, that's not quite there yet, and then they develop at your football club. Manchester United should be doing more of that. And I think that's something that Eric Ten Hag is looking to bring as a developmental coach rather than a Jose Mourinho wants to get the players ready and do it now. I think Manchester United fans are always welcome to a manager that wants to build something over a period of time for a longer period of time.
Do you feel that that these kind of changes are going to be sufficient to make you competitive? Or do you feel that we're just getting deeper and deeper into an era of Man City supremacy? And I suppose the most, um, in a way, obvious question and the defining question is that with clubs like City and Newcastle having the level of investment that they now have, are we going to see a new tier emerge in top flight uh, English football that sort of can't be penetrated by expertise and the, and the and the financial models that preceded these in particular those two well i was listening to what you were both saying about jordan henderson and i suppose that's the way football's gone if you'd said to me three or four years ago that united would be in pole position to be acquired by qatar i would be i don't really want that i don't like that model man city have had that model i don't like it but where we are now I'd, I'd say there's many a football fan who will agree with this, that if you want to be successful, so therefore in your lifetime, if you want to see your football club win trophies, then I don't see how it's possible without that level of, you know, um, unreserved wealth that the likes of Man City and Saudi Arabia with Newcastle have. So, um, I mean, look, Pep Guardiola has built a team over a number of years where he can say, I don't like that goalkeeper. I don't like that right back. I'll get a new one. I'll get a new one. He's a fantastic coach as well because they've acquired the best coach in the world. They've, inqu they've acquired uh, a brilliant re uh, structure around him in relation to recruitment and coaching. The infrastructure around Man City in relation to training facilities, it's all bought and it's all high level. And I think that if you want to compete with that, and I'd love to see teams compete with that, but I don't think you can without that sort of investment. Uh, it's either we're at the critical point, I think, of either regulation or embrace the fact that it's a financial mm. free for all. Isn't it? You either got to ban that and sort of in introduce meaningful financial regulation of like you can only spend this, wages can only be that, you know. But I would prefer regulation at the point of purchase. What do you think, Al? Yeah, I also, I think it's really interesting what you say there about infrastructure because it's something that isn't spoken about that much. You know, <clears throat> take Man United as an example. They've spent an awful lot of money over the last few years and yet haven't really had much to show for it at all in fact you'd say that that money's been badly spent in many many a case and then you look at man city obviously have spent a lot of money themselves but it feels like in terms of an infrastructure they've got something so solid that no one else is kind of competing with you look at like newcastle are trying to implement something similar and it feels like that's as important as the money that you're spending on players that you have to that what comes with that saudi money or that qatar money whatever it is is an infrastructure that's kind of unmatched and that that feels like that's your future route to dominating this league for the next five years. Do you, do you, do you think that that infrastructure is something that isn't maybe spoken about as much as the more eye-catching headlines around player transfers? I think the modern football fan is probably more aware of it than I was when I was younger. I mean, I, I mean, look, growing up in the late 80s, it was teletext. I had no idea who played for Bayern Munich, etc. And I think when you look at the Brightons and the Brentfords of the Premier League, their success isn't a coincidence. It's based on scouting systems that other big clubs are now trying to replicate that will take them a couple of years. So I think that the, the structure is massively important. And what Man I mean, at Newcastle, as soon as they were taken over, I think they went and took the head of development from Brighton. So you can, you can have money and you're right, Manchester United, I think even the CEO was caught saying 12 months ago that what we've spent in the last 10 years, you walk into Carrington, the training ground, and you go, where did it get spent? So I think Manchester City and Newcastle, not only are they rich, but they look at every level of the football club from youth to recruitment to fitness and spend on the best. And that's why you end up there because anybody can walk. I mean, look at Chelsea last year, spent ridiculous money. Hearts in the right place of Todd Bowley, but just wasted a load of money um, and ends up having to rebuild a club in the summer again. Mark, I want to include you in our predictions game for six games it's that over the weekend. I've drawn, yeah, quite accurately there next to our disembodied heads. That's yeah. my portrait of you. Uh, the first game, we've all got to make predictions. Now, I make my predictions in a very... Um, immediate reflexive way and they're regularly incorrect gareth is more ponderous and likes to really sort of take it seriously annoyingly so uh, almost and uh anyway i'd like to invite you to participate 
in these predictions. So the first game is Burnley v City. If you get the result correct, uh, the you know it's it's one point. Yes. If you get the the score exactly correct, then it's three points. That's how our system works. It's quite complex. Okay. <laughs> this could become the new fantasy football. In fact, we should make ourselves rich from this. It just occurred to me there. It could be mm. a thing. All right. I don't think you can own the football pools. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Burnley v Man City. Mark, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go 3-1 to Manchester City. Yeah, all right then. I'm going to go 4-0 City. What about you, Gal? 3-0. 3-0. Uh, Bournemouth, West Ham. Mm. Is that at Bournemouth, isn't it? I'll go, yeah. I'm going to go, go 2-1 away win for West Ham. Thank you. I've gone 2-0 two, two away win. What about you, Gal? I'll go 1-1. One, 1-1. One. One, one. Damn you. Yeah. Newcastle v Villa. Newcastle home. Yeah, that would be close, but I'll go with Newcastle's home form. I'll go 2-0 Newcastle. 2-0. Oh, oh, no, I'm going to say it's a surprising away win for some reason. And uh, you've gone to you've gone home win. And what about you, Gal? I'm going to go 3-2. I think they played the each Geordies. other in a, in a friendly in uh, pre-season. I think it was quite high scoring. Anyway. Oh, oh he, really th he really thinks he's got all the data, <laughs> doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Sam just, Allardyce. It should be a really brilliant game, that, actually. I'm looking forward to it. Brighton-Luton. Oh. oh, come on. Let's let have Luton win their first game of the season away to Brighton. I'm just going to say 1-0 to Luton. I'm voting with the heart. <laughs> what about you, Goldbridge? 5-0 Brighton. Fucking hell, mate. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, go for it. What about you, Gal? I'll go 1-0 Brighton. 1-0 Brighton. Be a good game, that. Yep. I'm excited about Luton. I like the anomaly of Luton. Proper Kenilworth Road, crap stadium, fans that are, <laughs> let's face it, a bit 1980s. <laughs> it's it's going to be a fantastic season. Um, all right, Chelsea, Liverpool, televised game. Oh. I think this has always been it, a contentious feature. It'll probably be awful as a result. It'll probably be something like nil-nil or one-one. Go on then. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go, I mean, I think they, they can be slow. Those they games. They cancelled right. each other out last season, but they were both awful last season. Oh, like nil-nil. I'm going to say nil-nil. Yeah, I'll, drab crap. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go one-one then to make it different from you. And what about what about you, Mark? I'll go Liverpool away win one-nil. Away win one nil. Oh, and then from the championship mm. to Hugh, my dear Gareth, Hull City versus Wednesday, Sheffield Wednesday, Hull City home. I'll go one one, one, one. I'll, uh, yeah, one oh, okay. one for me as well. One 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 one. We're allowed to say the same thing. I think Sheffield Wednesday <laughs> are going to win. It's their first game. <laughs> they came up in the playoffs, didn't they? And United. Do you think United will beat Wolves on Monday night, Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go three nil for that. Three. Mark saying three nil. Um, I'm gonna say, uh, yeah, two nil and Gal. Uh, yeah, um, three one United. I think Wolves are really gonna struggle this season. There you go. That's sorry for if you were listening or watching this, putting you through that sort of tedious process <laughs> of men just con contemplating numbers. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's, I'd love to talk to you again. I want to talk to you about how you went from being a police officer to a YouTube star. And I'd love to get into the sort of philosophical depths that only football can bring about. The whole point of our uh, podcast is to, is to engage in whimsy and philosophy. And on that note, why the hell are you in a Jamiroquai video? <laughs> thanks for having me on lads really enjoyed it love to do it again he's not going to tell us he won't tell us we'll never he's know next time he's a mysterious he's a man he's a space cowboy <laughs> <laughs> but will he ever return <laughs> thank you so much for joining us you can check Mark out on the United Stand on YouTube and follow him on Twitter at United Stand M-U-F-C that's all we got time for Football is Nice will be back next week and you can listen to our whole conversation on the Football is Nice podcast Morrow Show.